Hey there folks, welcome to Spectrum Pulse. We talk about music, movies, art, and culture. And today we're going to be talking about the newest album from Car Seat Headrest called Teens of Denial. But first let me propose a hypothetical scenario. You're a boss of a fairly well-regarded independent record label with a pretty potent roster but you're always hungry to expand. And in the course of sifting through so many prospects, you find an astoundingly prolific indie artist off a of band camp known for self-producing some surprisingly catchy indie rock that might have crossover potential. The hooks are that good. So do you sign the guy? And if so, how do you best market him? Well, if you're the CEO of Matador Records, this might seem like a no-brainer, but in Retrospect, bringing the critically acclaimed indie rock project Car Seat Headrest on board might have been more trouble than it's been worth. Oh, sure, for the production, it wouldn't have been a huge issue. No need to hire Steve Albini when the mastermind of the project, Will Toledo, effectively produced everything himself. But how to best position him onto the market, especially considering that he already had something of a cult following? In retrospect, I think Matador found a mostly workable solution with Teens of Style. Take cuts from his 11 self-released albums and slice them into a comprehensive whole with a little bit more polish to them. But it also meant that the buzz didn't really materialize in the same way, at least for critics like myself. I mean, I'd heard about Teens of Style, I heard it was good, but it was a compilation. I just didn't have the same drive to get into it. And yet, I started getting requests to cover the follow-up album, Teens of Denial, almost immediately. Although the headaches had only gotten worse for Matador and gotten a lot more public, too. As all physical copies of the album have gotten recalled over a sampling clearance mess surrounding an interpolation of a snippet of a car song, Just What I Needed, that Rick Agasek rescinded at the very last minute. Estimated a losses for Matador around $50,000. And for an indie label pushing a relative unknown, even despite some critical acclaim, that's a considerable loss for them. Now, thankfully, I was able to pick up the album still digitally off of Bandcamp to figure out what the fuss is all about this guy. So, what did I find? Well, folks, this is the sort of the album that's a little tough for me to evaluate, and not because it's bad. No, I could easily make the argument that it's probably going to land as one of my favorite albums of this year, but the problem is, it's me making that argument, because Teens of Denial by Car Seed Headrest is specifically made for two types of people. Teenagers who are cool enough to get invited to the parties, but never cool enough to really fit in, and music critics who grew up in the 90s and 2000s who love indie rock and maybe a bit of emo, and remember being those teenagers. Hi, everybody. As such, there's always been that additional element of due diligence that clicks into place when I started listening to an album like this that could easily play as critic bait, especially for my generation. So did Will Toledo manage to create something that transcends obvious pandering, or does it devolve into a bloated, self-indulgent mess? Well, let's not kid around ourselves here. It's a record focusing on teenage depression that averages a song length of nearly six minutes and flirts with the edges of modern emo. Of course, it's going to have some self-indulgent elements. The question becomes whether or not they're an issue, and the answer to that is occasionally it is, but not quite at the points where you might think. What should be remembered is that indie pop rock that Car Seat Headrest is drawing on, Paid Men, Early Weezer, maybe a bit of Slint, or even Green Day, tend to keep things fast-paced and brief, and that the underlying heavier emotions didn't hurt their hooks so momentum. Will Toledo operates under a slightly different approach, namely that if you throw enough catchy melodies and hooks into a song, it might get kind of cluttered and messy, but it would add up to more than the sum of its parts. And what gets astonishing is how often he's sticks the landing and forms cohesive songs with this. Mostly thanks to the lyrics, which we'll get to in a bit, but also because Will Toledo is a smart songwriter with a great handle for layering and sequencing his hooks. Take a song like the Ballad of the Costa Concordia, which runs for 11 and a half minutes and features a good four or five change-ups in mood and groove and sound, and yet all of them manage to work because they all feel thematically cohesive, naturally flow into each other, and lead to an ending that's kind of somber and a little bit eerie with the Mellotron, but still connects to a slightly alien but potent moment of intimacy. It's really quite poignant. Now, there are songs that do run a little long, get tied up into instrumental tangents. Despite a really strong opening with the slow build of horns and the organ near the end, Cosmic Hero does feel a little bit drawn out. An unforgiving girl she's not in could do for a tighter edit, especially on the outro. But the surprising thing is how many of these songs hold together with various brands of fuzzed out, ragged riffs, tight grooves, and sparse but workable percussion lines. And there really are some stellar moments here. The little wheedling riff that is contorted through horns in a two-step groove on Vincent. The sharper groove on Destroyed by Hippie Powers, the muted Mellotron that builds the great chorus of Drunk Drivers Killer Whales, and that outro for Joe gets kicked out of school for using drugs with friends but says this isn't a problem, it's one of the niftiest examples of tight writing mirrored by an instantly recognizable hook. Fantastic song. The way I initially described this album is if Rivers Cuomo saw fit to abandon pop structures altogether while still bringing his good hooks, but you know what, I think an American Idiot era Green Day comparison also can kind of work too. Although this album is nowhere near as clean as textures 
which for me is only a positive. There's a lot of grit to this record, which I really liked. But to this point, to get to the meat of this album, we need to talk about Will Toledo and his songwriting. Because while he's something of an unassuming vocalist, minus a few moments where he howls his lungs out pretty well, the writing on this record deserves a lot of attention, if only for its detail and layered complexity. It's the real star here. And I need to start with the framing, because while this album does have some personal references, Will Toledo is placing himself in the perspective of a depressed teenager, with a distinctive arc of his own. And what I appreciate is that while it's definitely a sympathetic and populist portrayal, it's also not shying away from portraying this alter ego's whiny, antisocial self-absorption, to the point where the masturbation metaphors start feeling a little too on the nose. And he doesn't shy away from painting this alter ego's actions as a reckless, stupid, or even done for all the wrong reasons, even if he does kind of sympathize with the overheated emotions that would drive those decisions in the first place. Now, this is where we encounter the major arc of this album, and that's depression. The cause isn't immediately apparent, but there's this miasma of toxic frustration, anger, and numb bitterness that permeates a lot of the writing, and it's not painted as cool. It's not a record looking to pander too much to teenage disaffection so much as take a frank look at what it's doing to them and everyone else around them. And like most teenagers, our protagonist spends the majority of this album running in the opposite direction of his problems, which is where the denial comes in spades. But it's also clear that he's got his reasons for that. The looming presence of authority figures like parents and cops and God that stare down disapprovingly are probably a big factor of why he just wants to pretend that everything's just okay, especially when it's hard enough for him to fit in regardless in his social scene because he's a little weird in his own way and he can't communicate what he wants, which is established very early on, even if he doesn't even know what he wants. Yo, you could argue he doesn't even really know how to communicate who he is. Now, it's not what I need. It fills the car sample with an inverted guitar lead and a sample of a half-heard phone call where he tries to explain his band and mostly fails. It's not quite as punchy as the original version, but there is some poignancy there, and this ties into another major theme that's very relevant to the millennials that this teenager represents. The weight of self-obsession, where between internalized expectations, a subsequent dismissal of them, and a desire to have it all put together, it's led to all sorts of reckless experience chasing to disguise the deeper emptiness within that they don't know how to fill. And so we get acid and mushrooms at the same time, leading to terrible trips, or a desperate drunken trip home, or trying to find someone with similar problems to build a connection with, even off on some level, it just feels like all that much more masturbation. Now, it definitely feels like there are many points where you could take this as moralizing about my generation and talking down to it. Cosmic Hero, for instance, is probably speaking at our protagonist with a healthy dose of get the hell over yourself, highlighting how much teenage complaining could be resolved with some straightforward thinking and rationalization, or even just suicide if they're just that anxious to cut themselves off from the world and that focused on themselves. But Will Toledo is smart enough to realize that millennials have already internalized the get over yourself mantra, and it's not the real problem here. It's covering up the depression and deep-seated rage that comes with being raised as entitled and then publicly dismissed by a generation who would prefer to dump on those coming after rather than take responsibilities for their own failures. And that's one of the major reasons why the Ballad of the Costa Concordia is easily the best song in this album and definitely my favorite, where the veils are burned away and while our protagonist has no problem admitting that our own generation has plenty of screw-ups, it also points the finger back at a lack of real-life guidance from those authority figures, celebrating individual successes to the point of meaningless this weight against everybody else and how all of that might give a certain generation a complex. It's why the line, I give up, anchors the chorus. No more masks, no more repression and denial, just acceptance of mortality and that we have all been our own worst enemies all along. As Ott might have said it, I'm no longer afraid to dance tonight. I'm no longer afraid to die. And I really appreciate how Toledo ends this album. First with a middle finger to teenage conformity and that navel-gazing masturbation isn't just universal, but a sign that maybe no generation has a clue of where they're going overall. And on the final song, the final little snippet, with our narrator reaching out to a horse before being pulled away, there's empathy extended across both sides to whatever demons they're battling because in the end of the day, we're all in this together. In short, Look, I can go on about the writing of this record and how goddamn clever it is all day, and how much of the hook-driven guitar work will really stick in your brain like nothing else. But a larger question is whether or not it all works, or whether or not it's just more than critic bait. Honestly, it's damn close to getting there. As much as I credited the thematic progressions and can excuse a lot of the self-indulgence, there are a 
few points that push me. Also, bizarrely, I get the impression that Will Toledo could have ended a fair few of these songs better with a more satisfying chord or structure. There are a few songs I think could have hit a little bit harder with the stronger ending. But while I can nitpick on a few instrumental points beyond that, like the Mellotron running through the riff of Not What I Needed, or the backing vocals not really working for me on Unforgiving Girl She's None, for the most part, I really dug the hell out of this album. For me, it's an extremely strong 8 out of 10 and definitely a high recommendation. But look, every critic who covers indie rock on the planet has given this album a lot of critical acclaim, so let me put it in a different way. If you're looking for one of the most smart, nuanced, and yet most sincere portrayals of the me generation that sure as hell is not catering to anybody, Teens in Denial by Car Seat Headrest required listening. Otherwise, Look, it's great indie rock that only occasionally gets entirely up its ass and pretentious. In other words, it's worth a little bit more than what you bargained, but less than what you paid. And if that's not a deal, I don't know what is. So yeah, thanks a lot for watching. If you want to like and subscribe, I'd be more than grateful. Anything else I might be able to do to improve my presentation coming up, or anything else I might be able to do to cover upcoming albums, I'd be more than happy to give them a listen. Yeah, and I've got the poll up here, so if you guys just want to tell me how much more awesome this album is, I'd be happy to hear your opinions. Beyond that... I'm Mark, you're watching Spectrum Pulse, and I'll see you next time.